In the real-life documentary franchise Fallout, a reckless and idiotic tariff war between the US and China leads to nuclear war. And in October 2077, within just a matter of hours, the world is reduced to rubble. Almost a century later, a handful of survivors venture out from their underground vaults to find the place a right mess and infested with giant irradiated scorpions and mole rats, and they begin to rebuild. This assessment was only a little off in some details, not least the idea that the US would ever be so silly as to engage in a suicidal tariff war with China, but mostly because of how long it took to rebuild, or more specifically, how fast their recovery was. But they were spot on with the mole rats, because around 250 million years ago, a real global meltdown occurred, one that marked the end of the Permian and ushered in the new age of the dinosaurs. But it didn't happen quickly. It took up to 30 million years for terrestrial vertebrates to fully recover, and for the first chunk of that time, there really was only one animal around, the Triassic's equivalent of a mole rat, Lystrosaurus. And in the absence of, well, everything, this little piggy-esque proto-mammal absolutely went to market, becoming the most common terrestrial vertebrate of the early Triassic by a wide margin. This is the story of how a single fallout survivor came to dominate the wasteland and how, for a remarkably long time, everything was just pigs. And it begins with the great dying. The ocean floor is a great place to learn about geological history. It's where we see the routine flipping of the magnetic poles and the motion of the tectonic plates. Unfortunately, it's also a place of continuous recycling, as it sinks, melts, and is extruded again as new rock, in a process that cycles around 200 million years. So this unfortunately makes it absolutely useless at identifying the causes of the Great Dying, which occurred over 250 million years ago. From limited terrestrial evidence, then, the usual suspects have been proposed. Giant asteroids, giant volcanoes, hypoxia of the oceans, and desertification of the land. It may be human arrogance that there is no widely considered hypothesis that involves a brief-lived technological race with a case of terminal short-sightedness, but this can't truly be counted out. Whatever it was, though, life went from being very diverse to being not very diverse at all. Some estimates point to terrestrial vertebrates almost entirely disappearing within 50,000 years. Others extend this time frame by an order of magnitude, but some go the other way, with estimates of life extinguishing over a period of just a few thousand years. Any of these estimates represents the blink of an eye in geological and evolutionary time frames, and the outcome is the same regardless. More than two-thirds of amphibians, reptiles, and therapsids suddenly disappeared. Land vertebrates had been decimated, and the survivors had taken heavy losses, Many that got through the event dwindled to extinction in the years to come, and yet they got off lightly. Over 95% of marine species were lost. It is almost impossible to exaggerate what catastrophe this was for biology. By 2281, the city of New Vegas was up and running and humanity was well on track to making a complete recovery. But in the post-Great Dying Wasteland, there was no such immediacy in the rebound on land. In fact, it would take up to 30 million years for the terrestrial vertebrate fauna to reach pre-war numbers and for the ecosystem to rebalance itself. Since the Carboniferous, terrestrial plants had been laying down coal deposits almost non-stop, but after the Great Dying, there's a conspicuous lack of coal, known as the Coal Gap, that drifts well into the early Triassic. No coal implies no trees, and this might have something to do with the new herbivorous overlords that were having a right old party in the dusty and poisoned wastelands of the time. It would be 10 million years before plants would adapt to the irradiated fields, and this could be for a number of reasons, but one factor was likely the immense prevalence of the pig-like Lystrosaurus that was soon swarming the lands. Lystrosaurus was about as close as you can find to a giant mole rat from Fallout, and it's easy to imagine that the early Triassic landscapes were similar to the Mojave wastelands of the 2080s. But unlike the mole rats in Fallout, Lystrosaurus didn't mutate from its ancestral form in the irradiated caves of a post-war world. It came through the extinction event intact. 
This was a genus that shows up as part of the diverse faunal array of the late Permian, primarily occupying the lower half of Pangaea where Antarctica, Africa, Russia, India and China were once neighbours. Pre-war Lystrosaurus were themselves more diverse with around four to seven species showing up in the fossil record, but only one or two of these made it through to the Triassic. Lystrosaurus curvatus, the vault dweller of the early Triassic, was a large member of the genus and had several characteristics that were likely to have helped it become one of the only animals around for so many years. This was the least specialized species known from the genus, which no doubt is how it was so much better suited to survival. But it was also likely to be a very gregarious or even social animal, which allowed it a dimension of tolerance to extreme weather conditions. It was likely a burrower, too, and it may have exhibited extremely fast growth rates and the rapid maturation that is evidenced in fossils of other dicynodont genera. Antarctica of the time may have played a role in providing a more stable and temperate refuge for survivors, and Lystrosaurus fossils are quite prevalent there. The first fossils of this genus were found in India, then more in South Africa, and soon after Antarctica was throwing up plenty more. Now, Lystrosaurus wasn't technically a pig. In fact, mammals weren't a thing at the turn of the Triassic. They'd come in a bit later, around 50 million years later, actually, as descendants of a group of therapsids known as cynodonts. Cynodonts were one of the two therapsid lineages to survive the Permian-Triassic fiasco, with the dicynodonts being the other, and it is this latter group that Lystrosaurus belonged to. Permian species ranged from mole rat to giant mole rat in size, around half a metre to upwards of 2.5 metres long. They had short, shovel-like snouts and possibly strong beaks like those of the Ceratopsians many millions of years later. Like modern lizards, Lystrosaurus had a more sprawling gait than the mammalian herbivores of today, but it was pig-sized, social, short-faced, and had two prominent tusks poking out from its upper jaw. Recent finds of very mummified specimens also show clues as to its outer appearance and appear to show dimpled, leathery skin. It was also necessarily an unfussy eater, as whatever was left of the flora in the wake of the Permian extinction would have been its primary food. So this was, for all intents and purposes, a pig before pigs. And it did very well. While complete ecological recovery on land took 30 million years, Lystrosaurus was up and about almost immediately and became so successful that in many places in its range, fossils suggest Lystrosaurus made up 90 to 95% of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. Early Triassic Pangaea would have been riddled with these things, roaming the lands, munching on any vegetable trying to break through and huddling together for warmth in cozy burrows. Growth rings on fossil bones suggest they could have also hibernated, which would make them the oldest known animals to do so. And it was perhaps this pre-extinction adaptation to living underground that allowed them to survive in an atmosphere of much less oxygen that persisted well into the early Triassic. With nothing much else in their way, the genus radiated successfully out as a pioneer species for millions of years. And while there so far appears to have been only one surviving species of the extinction, a paper from 2024 suggests that rapid radiation throughout the early Triassic led to speciation events all over the landmass. Unfortunately for Lystrosaurus, its reign as the dopey herbivorous overlord of the wasteland would eventually come to an end. Once the dust had settled, the Pseudosuchium lines that survived into the Triassic would rise up and become the top predators of the land, and the dinosaurs that they hunted would in turn take over that role towards the end of the period. But as true pioneers, Lystrosaurus surrendered their role both ecologically and evolutionarily. There's no sign that Lystrosaurus went extinct in the traditional sense, so they were likely ancestral to many of the later Dicynodont lines. Having proven greatly successful as generalists, they would probably have expanded into more specialized niches as the competition from new herbivores and the selective forces of predators arose. Dicynodonts as a whole ground to a halt by the end of the Triassic, having done their job of repopulating the lands, providing selective forces to the new generation of terrestrial plants, and about 30 million years of bottomless pork for the predators. But for one brief moment, a period of millions of years, the majority of vertebrate life on land was Lystrosaurus.
Mr. Soros provides us with an incredible, real-life story of post-apocalyptic survival. But it's also a cautionary tale to take with us into the future. As much as it's fun to imagine and romanticize a post-catastrophe survival story, the reality of it is unlikely to be worth the effort. The chances that such a large and high-maintenance species as humans would be one of the few to survive it in the first place are already slim, but besides that, unless you're comfortable eating slop, burrowing and hiding out on Antarctica for millions of years, it's probably a much better idea to avoid the whole thing in the first place. If you've enjoyed this one, please give us a like and subscribe for the next ones, and always leave comments to let us know how we can improve. That's all for today's video. Thanks for watching.